Riding shotgun refers to the practice of sitting next to the driver in a moving vehicle. The term riding shotgun came around after the time of the stagecoach, when somebody used to sit next to the driver holding a shotgun, in case they ran into bandits. My name is Charlie Cook, and I drive a lot. I like to talk to people while I'm driving, so I interview people in my car while I'm driving. Welcome to Riding Shotgun with Charlie. All right, welcome to this episode of Riding Shotgun with Charlie. Today, we are in Greeley, Pennsylvania, and I have two gentlemen with me. One of them is Lieutenant Lou Lusk. Lou, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Charlie. And in the back seat, I have Rick, whose last name I can't remember. Capozzi. Capozzi, Rick Capozzi from Survival Mindset. And we are gonna have these guys on the show. See, Rick had to come with Lou because Lou Lou eats crayons? Is that what the deal is? No, no, no. 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 <laughs> Marines. That's, Marines eat the crayons. Sorry about that. Lou makes fun of them for eating crayons. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lou, Lou has an incredible story that he's going to share with us. He was one of the uh, he was one of the men that went in went in and rescued Jessica Lynch, which I think you said was one of the the first successful POW rescue POW. missions since the Vietnam War. Unbelievable. April first, two thousand and three. God, unbelievable. All right, let's do this. So, um, Lou, tell us uh, tell us about you. How, how long were you in the military? How long did you serve for? 29 years, sir. 29 years? Yes. God bless you. That's amazing. 14 active and 15 in the uh, Pennsylvania Guard God. with uh, special operations. That is that is amazing. Very cool. Um, how about you, Rick? Any military service? No, sir. Nope. No military service, no law enforcement service. I'm a learning strategist who specializes in behavioral change in stressful situations. So I oftentimes get introduced as a nationally recognized expert on the topic of preparing for armed intruders. But between just us, I'm the conduit to the experts, <laughs> such as Lieutenant Lou. All right. So. 29 years, God bless you. Um, and you, 14, you said 14 tours? No, 14 years. I'm sorry. Yeah, how how many tours did you do in? Um, seven since the global war on terrorism I ended up doing. Wow, that is amazing. And he can't tell you about before that. <laughs> Otherwise he has to kill me? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard about these guys. Um, so you were you were you were one of the men who saved Jessica Lynch. I was part of the team. Part of the team. Yes. So tell us about this. How does all this come about? How what what led up to her getting captured and your team going in to rescue her? Um, <clears throat> what ended up happening was there was five of us from my unit here in Pennsylvania that were put in with. Um, JSOC, mm -hmm. and uh, which is the Joint Special Operations Command. Um, this was all classified, hush hush. Um, it has been released now because there's a book out there called Cobra Two. Um, we are part of Task Force Twenty. Um, the book tells about the complete makeup of the task force. Mm -hmm. uh, tells who all was part of it. It tells all the missions that we completed. It shows all our routes of travel to those missions and everything. Um, I didn't even know about this until I went to drill one day and my uh, chief master sergeant who was one of the ones that knew that uh, five of us from our unit was actually on the task force. And he threw the book at me and he's like, here, read about yourself. <laughs> oh my <laughs> it gosh. was like, what? And uh, because when we came home, we went to Fort Bragg and we had to sign all these papers for non-disclosure. We wouldn't talk about anything. Wow. We would be locked up in jail if we ever opened our mouths, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, wow, here's this book. Right. I didn't do this. I didn't open up my mouth. Somebody else did. Are yeah. they going to get in trouble? Written by a general. Wow. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it is what it is. But that was... Um, probably one of the greatest missions, 
one of the greatest deployments I had. Yeah. Um, God, the five guys I served with from Pennsylvania here, um, I couldn't ask for better people. Really? My unit as a whole, um, couldn't ask for better people in the whole unit. No. Mm. There was so much synergy at that place. Yeah. It was just like, just like a family. It was, it was amazing. There wasn't anything that anybody wouldn't do for anybody. Wow. It was just a yeah. true family organization. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Um, how does, uh, so, uh, Jessica Lynch and, and saving her. Um, so what, what led up to this? Just to refresh people's memories. What ended up happening was, um, her vehicle convoy that she was a part of got ambushed. Mm -hmm. And, um, the vehicle that she was traveling in ended up, um, they got ambushed because they got lost in a sandstorm. Her vehicle during the ambush, um, whoever the driver was, ended up, because of the mass confusion, mm -hmm. um, ran into the back end of the vehicle that was in front of them. Oh, during that vehicle accident, Jessica was knocked unconscious. Yeah. So she never put up a fight. So the Fedaheen didn't know that she was there. Mm -hmm. So once they had terminated everybody that was on the convoy, they went up to take care of their loot that they were going to get the American equipment and everything. Sure. And realized that they had an American hostage that was a female. Wow. And ended up taking her to the hospital compound. Mm -hmm. After they had their way with her, um, there was a female doctor at the hospital compound whose husband found out about it through conversations with his wife. He walked approximately, I believe it was 28 clicks, 28 kilometers to the um, American unit that was closest to him. And he gave the information up, which then was up channeled and then back down channeled to our task force over there for all special operations. And it was put out to um, set up for the rescue mission. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing was they made a big to-do about Jessica, which so be it. Um, that night also, along with Jessica, we repatriated um, 13 American soldier bodies that were uh, buried in shallow graves in a compound that uh, wow. were out there in the heat. Someone, um, I had a passenger on my show, her name was Kim Petters, and she spent 10 years in the military bringing bodies back from the Middle East. And she said it's not just, not just the things that you can't unsee, but she said there are smells that you can't unsmell. Right. And, and that's got to be the same. And then my last tour over there, I was a... I like to consider it a BMT pilot, sir. I like to say I flew a big mahogany desk. Um, <laughs> a BMT, a big mahogany desk. <laughs> so I was a BMT pilot. Um, I still went outside the wire with my guys. Um, my colonel, uh, one of the greatest guys I ever worked for, too. Um, colonel Craig Arts, a uh, great man. let me go outside with the guys because they had to go outside like two or three times a day mm -hmm. on patrols and uh, he would always ask me he's like uh, why is my operations superintendent going outside the wire and I, like, yeah. Sir, I said I don't know what to fix unless I know what's broken Good and, point. Uh, he took that for the first couple of weeks and he's like there, uh, sergeant there's nothing broke that bad <laughs> you don't need to go out there and I'm like you know, I just, I, I've always done stuff with my guys, you know, and, and he knew, because he told me, he's like, you know, it's going to be hard for you to be the one to tell people to do stuff and not do it with them. Oh, yeah. And it, 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 
It was. That was very difficult. Um, but once again, he was a great commander. Um, so I lost my fifteen. Where were we? Um, uh, no, we're, we're we're talking about you. you um, oh. Jessica Lynch. Yeah, thank you. Commander, you're, you're out. You're, you're and, going out. You're. Yeah. Did you know it was going to be recovery? Yes. That's what everybody was briefed. Um, so recovery means you're not. You're, you're looking, rescue. Rescue, not recovery. Okay. So rescue is. Rescue is live, and recovery is not. Right. Okay. We didn't know about the recovery. We knew about the rescue. You, gotcha. And. Uh, so they, um, the tier one guys went inside, got Jessica, mm -hmm. and brought her out. Where, where was she being held? Was was she at the hospital? She was at the hospital compound. Okay. Yes. Uh, in an American hospital compound or in no Iraqi hospital? Okay. Compound. So 
myself, I truly believe this. You guys were our greatest generation. Yeah. I said, when we got attacked, I said, you guys lined up in droves to enlist. Mm -hmm. To go take the fight to the enemy. I said, um, you know, people were committing suicide because they couldn't get in the military. I said, it's just unbelievable. And what you guys went through and endured. Yeah. I, I said, you're our greatest generation. I said, are we that much of a weaker generation than you guys? Mm -hmm. I said, because, you know, you, you don't hear anything about PTSD from World War II vets. Right. Or the Korean War vets. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, I remember my grandfather would sit in the corner, you know, and stare at the wall, stare outside the window, or yeah. stare at the TV when it wasn't on. And he'd sit there, you know, quiet as can be for like a couple hours. And then he'd get up and he'd come over and he'd join the rest of the family. Right. But it was nothing like you have today. And I asked him that. And this guy was so smart, Charlie. He said, no, Sergeant. He said, it's not that you're a weaker generation. He said, you got to take a look at the big picture, Sergeant. He said, when we went over, mm -hmm. we fought our war. Yeah. We fought a long war. We fought it. But he said, when our war was over, we were kept as an occupying force, but we were kept together right. as our company, mm -hmm. as a cohesive unit. He said, we got to decompress together. Yeah. And he said, you know, by the time it, it was done and we got shipped home, we were kept together as a unit. And we came home together mm -hmm. and we got to decompress on the boat ride home. Yeah. And he said, then we were stationed together until they finally disbanded us and, and sent us home but he's like we were always together and decompressing right he said you guys since vietnam and the, yeah vietnam vets i i feel so bad for because they were totally crapped on oh my god when they got home absolutely yeah yeah and he's like since vietnam he said you guys go over you fight your war that they send you to fight and he's like, when your war's over, they ship you on a plane and you're home in 12 hours and you're done. Right. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. And he, and he gets it. But, you know, somebody that gets it. There's this World War II vet that gets it. But the government didn't get it. And then when they finally realized it, it was like they tried to put a fix into it. Mm -hmm to send everybody to a demob site coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, especially the, you know, guard and reserve units they were sending over. But you take, it, it doesn't even matter the age. You take a young kid or you take a guy in his 40s that's married and has a family. Okay, this guy got spin-up training he went to. You just took him from his job and his family. You sent him over for 18 months to fight the conflict, he comes back. Now you're sending him to a demob site. All these guys want to do is go back to their family, go back to their normal life. Right. And you're telling them, okay, we're at this demob site. Are you having these issues? And they know if they raise their hand and say, yeah, I'm having these issues, that they're going to be stuck right, right where they are at the demob site. Yeah. Nobody wants to do that. They want to go they home. They want to go home, sure. Absolutely. Now, if the government would have came down and said, okay, you have these issues, we're going to help you out, mm -hmm. but we're going to let you go home and we're going to get the help you need back home. Yeah. Then yes. But, you know, you know you're being stuck away from your family even longer. Mm. Nobody wants that. You're going to hide the issues that you have. Right. And they wonder why there's 22 vets 22 a day taking day. their own lives. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. That would probably be a really big fix and take care of a lot of these issues, knowing that these these men and women that have gone out to take care of our country, that we can we can take care of them when they when they when when they're done, when they go back home. Yes. I did the same thing. I crawled into a bottle. Yeah. I self-medicated every day. Oh man. And I actually I wear this tattoo to remind me and to help other people that yes, I deal with demons. And not only did I deal with demons, I 
got this kill 22 ring because you put it on your trigger finger because yes I got stupid I was drunk and thank God God saved me again because I was drunk that I forgot I didn't put my firing pin back in my weapon when I put it together and I tried to kill myself Wow! and God has saved me five times four from the enemy once from myself and I don't know what his purpose is for me but he has a reason that he saved me and I don't know if it's working with Rick because I found Rick uh -huh. to work with Rick on active shooter because this is my passion I want to save people I want to help save people I want to help protect people Let's talk about your tattoo. I was trying to, I saw it, I was trying to read it, try to figure it out. Okay, sure. Um, we'll get a, I'll get a picture of it that I can put in there. But you've got the semicolon. Yes. Okay, it's supposed to be, it is actually OD green. Okay. I don't know if you can tell that or not. And do you know what a semicolon means? When a semicolon author? is when you, uh, you thought about taking your life and you decide not to because it's not done. Right? Like it's not over. Right. Because an author There's... was going to end the story but decided to continue on anyway. Yes. Yes. Um, the IGY is I got your. And then oh, I guess six. six. Okay. Um, the IGY is in black because it's the black space you fall into when you're dealing with issues in your PTSD mm -hmm. and your TBI. The six is red for blood. Yeah. And then underneath it, I got actually the 22. the 22 blood splattered because every day 22 vets take their own lives when they're dealing with their issues of PTSD and mm. TBIs. Got it. Okay. That, that all makes sense. You're supposed to actually get it on your right arm. It's supposed to be highly visible. So that way, if I come up to another vet and I shake his hand, you can he see sees that I've dealt with these issues mm. and he knows he can trust me and confide in me yeah and that I, I have his back I will help him that's incredible in any way that I can that is intense can I tell you I interviewed uh, Teddy Daniels down here at the Rod of Iron Freedom Festival last year and I interviewed Stephen Williford and it seems like we're taking the same route that we took when I would, took with them and it seems like all the 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 three interviews that I've gotten the, since I've been at these events, they're all intense. They're all deeply intense and like, holy crap, man. Um, the other thing I would like to share from major winners that I learned, mm -hmm. um, I do this in our um, closing ceremonies when we teach is, um, I wish I had my picture here to show you. It's beautiful yeah it's uh major winners and all his guys standing in front of their aircraft mm -hmm. loading up before they took off to jump into normandy and it has the full speech on there and major winners signed it for me and put his slogan that he always puts which is hang tough mm -hmm. um it's beautiful isn't it yes it is um i take it to some of the events yep another thing i asked major winners was about you know i said Major, I said, how did you guys stay in that little plane stuffed in there mm -hmm. and, and keep your wits about yourself flying across the English Channel, like knowing at that time you were jumping into Fortress Europe, which was supposed to be impenetrable, yeah. but yet not knowing what you were getting into. I said, you know, because every time I went outside the wire, whether it be vehicle or rotary, I said, uh, you know, it, it's like cutting diamonds, you know, you're just scared crapless. Mm. And I said, you, you, you can't show that to the younger troops because if you do, your mission's done. Kaput before you even go outside. Yeah. And uh, he's like, Sarge, he said, this is, this is one of the greatest things I've ever heard in my entire life too, Charlie, which is why I like to share it with people. He said, the only difference between a hero and a coward is under any circumstance, a hero will always do the right thing and revert to his training. Uh -huh. And I was like, 
thinking on it. I was like, wow. You know, you talk about KISS. Keep it simple, stupid, because that's how I like to operate. Mm -hmm. I was like, that is just amazing. Because when you think about it, yes, you're scared. And, and he even said this. He said, if you're not scared, he said, I don't want you with me. Right. Which is kind of why he had a little problem with Sergeant Garnier. Because Garnier just had a death wish and wanted to kill everybody because of what the news he got about his brother before they went out. Mm -hmm. And, um, anyway, uh, I was thinking about it, and it's like, you know, when you first go outside, you know, you're scared because you don't know what's going to happen. Right. And whenever you get hit, it's like, holy crap. And then your training kicks in. It's automatic. Mm -hmm. And then do what you have to do. After it's over, the adrenaline rush leaves you. And then you're like, whoa. And then, and then it hits you. You reflect on it, and then the fear comes back. Yeah. That's wild. And it's like, man, he was so right. Like, mm. unbelievable. It's automatic impulse. You know, and one of the things that I always think of, too, is the military is so great at teaching you how to do a job. They're phenomenal. The one thing they truly suck at is teaching you how to deal with the effects of doing that job. Mm. Which is why we're losing 22 guys a day. Right. Charlie, you might want to ask Lou how many birthdays he has. How many birthdays do you have? Two? So how many birthdays do you have? I have two anniversaries. Yeah? Yeah. The one you were born? It's, no. Just anniversaries. I have. Anniversaries, okay. I have the anniversary date that I married my wife, which, God love her. Um, I say God sent me a guardian angel mm. when he sent my wife to me yeah. and let me meet my wife. Um, I fell in love with and married my best friend. That's awesome. Um, she was a uh, psych nurse. Funny, I was teaching a mental health class to her, and she was a psych nurse. She didn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be teaching that day. She didn't want to have to go to class but for something she was educated on. Yeah. And uh, it was very funny, our first meeting. And, um, you know, I always say I'm a, I'm a football bat, because that's what the VA tells me. I'm messed up like a football bat. <laughs> Or a soup sandwich, so. A soup sandwich or a football bat. I've never yeah. heard I of those. <laughs> those are great. Um, but, uh, Your you other know, anniversary. Huh? Your other anniversary. Is April 1st, 2003. April um, 1st, 2003, okay. Yeah, I should have never came home from that. Wow. But that was one of the four times I was say One of the five. Mm. But, um, I thank God every day for my wife. It's not easy living with somebody who has mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, one of the best things I've heard about mental illness, in case there's any of your listeners out there that have it or they deal with somebody with it. Yeah. Um, one of the best examples I ever heard about this is, and it's totally great. Um, When you have a physical injury, you know, the doctors, they can take you and they can throw a cast on you, they can do an right. operation, they can do anything they need to, to fix that injury, mm -hmm. up to and including giving you a new part. Right. Or a mechanical part to take the place. Mm -hmm. When it comes to a mental health injury, instead of being broken, you're more shattered and they it's can to put, that back put together. you back together yeah but you're never going to be the same as you were 
Mm. And you hear it from everybody. Um, and I know if your listeners out there are, have experienced this, I, I know you guys have heard it. And you're probably in the same boat as I was, you know. Mm-hmm. Everybody tells you, hey, you're not the same person you were when you left. Right. You know, and if if you're like I was, you know, I was in don- denial, constant denial. Sure. You know, and to me, I always say, excuses only satisfy those of us that use them. You know, I, I made every darn excuse in the world, you know. Mm-hmm. Hey, I don't want to lose my clearance. Right. I don't want to lose my team. I don't want to lose my guys. I made excuse after excuse why I don't want to go get out. Mm. And by the time I finally put, am I allowed to curse at all on your show? Curse away, man. By the time I finally put no, my no one, no one watches it, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. Not true. <laughs> by the time I pulled my head out of my ass. Yeah. And got help. I, I lost my family, my marriage, everything. Oh yeah. man. Um, I was I was broken. Yeah. And you know, but now I'm better off. I'm, I'm much better off. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes we go through life and we have these these difficult experiences, and they suck to go through. But when you get through them, you end up. A better person. Yeah. Yes. And I am a much better person because of my yeah. wife. Yeah. Uh, this is ridiculous, but um, it's not even close comparing it. I'm a divorced guy. I went through divorce about ten years ago. I'm a better person because of my ex-wife. <laughs> because all the stuff I'm doing now, I wouldn't have been able to do if I was married. You know. So I, uh, I, I know she doesn't watch the show, so I'm okay saying this. But I'm, I'm glad she divorced me because I wouldn't be on the path that I'm on now if I stayed married. And and I love everything I'm doing now. So well, I'm glad I got divorced too because I would have never met my wife, who's my soulmate. Yeah. And it, it's amazing when you marry your best friend. Hmm. It's just so much that's, different. That's what they tell me. All right, don't go looking for love, Charlie, because when it comes, finds you, it's so much better. Believe me, I'm not looking. I'm doing my best to avoid it. (laughs) All right, I think we are, uh, this is, I think, where we find, where we want to turn. This is. I have no idea where we're at, sir. That is okay. That is quite all right. Uh, Classes that you, you talked about teaching some classes. What kind of classes do you do? Do you do some classes with, uh, with Rick? Yes, sir. Very cool. Rick, tell us about the classes you guys do at uh, Survival Mindset. Yeah, so our main focus at Survival Mindset is training everyday people. Might be church people, might be school people, might be business people Mm -hmm. on preparing for armed (coughs) intruders. You know, what can you learn that you can do to potentially prevent, ideally? You know, what are the warning signs? What are you looking for? Mm -hmm. The second thing is, how do you respond? If you find yourself in a situation, and then finally, it's it's how to you know how to survive, yeah. uh, not just get through the incident, but you know we oftentimes talk about what happens the first three hundred seconds, right? That first five minutes after the situation potentially has has resolved itself one way or another, yeah. but before the EMTs, paramedics, etc., get inside. That's the greatest opportunity for us to save lives. You know, so that's the primary focus of our, you know, of our training. You know, we also do some other things on uh, risk vulnerability assessments and so forth. But the true core of what we do is pulling together, you know, the Stephen Williford's, the Teddy Daniels, the Lou Lusks of the world, and with their respective expertise and knowledge. Um, and it's not just traditional classroom training. I mean, we run mini drills. We run real-time drills. Uh, we did one not long ago. We had nine different agencies, including Life Flight, who flew a helicopter in for us. And wow. we took over uh, an entire school district. We had two buildings and um, had uh, um, uh, somewhere between 40 and 50 responders in addition to all the school you know, staff, faculty, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting because the fire chief, who, who actually 
killed himself by accident. He he opened a door that he knew was armed. I mean, mock wow. armed, right. but he knew it was armed. And when he went out and he went to come back in, he chose the wrong chose the wrong door. Oh, and man. he told me afterwards. He said, "We train all the time." He said, "We've never done something with that level of realism." Wow. So depending on who the group is, sometimes it's very basic. We'll come in and work with a church that's never had a safety security team. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's a little bit more advanced as well. But if I can swing back to something Lou said about his yeah. you know, his mission, the one commonality with virtually everybody on the team is they have a a strong mission to make a difference in other people's lives and to save lives we have uh, uh, we actually have records of five people that we know of went through our training and within a period of I think the longest was two years after the training actually found themselves in a uh, active shooter situation wow. where bullets were flying you know oh and it's God. really neat when you get a text message at 11:30 at night you know forwarded from your client who mm -hmm. had a uh, I think this girl was maybe 19 years old when she went through the training she was a uh, summer staff counselor yeah. and she said to the to our client she said uh, when you forced us to go through that you know that armed intruder training I didn't think I would ever use it let alone three months later mm. and she said I'm standing in a Walmart parking lot some guys inside shooting up the place not only did I get myself out but I led several other people as well Unbelievable. so yes. we get we get stories like that another one was a guy that uh, um, happened uh, right here in Pennsylvania and he was able to get himself and his wife to safety mm -hmm. and his wife said we need to get further away and he said I need to stay because I've been trained on what to do afterwards and it's going to be a little time until the EMTs and paramedics get here right. I might be needed you know that was a you know was a huge uh, a huge compliment but when you take the knowledge base that a Lou Lusk has and we put it in front of these people and he trains them based on his experiences the bad stuff that he went through is now being used for good you know on helping people to prepare for these types of situations right that is that is pretty amazing that is pretty wild I uh, the ongoing education stuff it really is important and I I know that for me the more the more advanced training classes that I take mm -hmm. the more I'm like this is a bigger responsibility than I first realized. You nailed it. You know, carrying carrying a firearm is a bigger responsibility. Like, we all think we want to do it. We all have delusions of grandeur of being... I, I wanted to be somebody that took out a terrorist at a mall. Mm -hmm. like, like, when I first got into it, I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. And ten, eight years after I got into it, there was a church that we went to. There was a mosque down the road. And the mosque had a school. And one of the seventh grade teachers was planning on planning on a terrorist attack at the mall in, in the little town I live uh, little town near where I live in Massachusetts and and I remember telling my then father-in-law and said I want to be a guy that takes out a terrorist at the Solomon Bond Mall and eight years later there was a guy that was planning on a terrorist attack at the Solomon Bond Mall um, but I at the time I didn't realize how serious uh, how serious it was to, to carry a gun, right. and the more the more training I take, the more I'm like, yeah, this is uh, this is serious stuff, man. Like you don't want to fool with this. Yeah, if I can dovetail onto that, what's interesting, you reference one component of it. Obviously, you know when a, a bad guy comes in with the intent to do harm, mm -hmm. and typically to do a lot of harm. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's targeted, but a, a true rapid mass killing, they're gonna keep going until most likely somebody stops them, yeah. or uh, somebody gets close enough, whether it's law enforcement, civilian, or whatever, that they then make the decision, the last act of gaining control is to, is know, to, commit, suicide. to, to commit suicide. Yeah. But what's interesting is everybody has a role to play. So we train people who've never touched a firearm and frankly will never touch a firearm. Mm -hmm. But we teach them something as simple as the right way to call 911 and what to say when you call 911. Oh yeah. Right? We teach them, you know, how do you how do you stop the bleed? Right? If mm -hmm. somebody, you know, if somebody has an arterial bleed, you've got two to four minutes before there's no coming back for them. Yeah. You know, so what can you do if you have no equipment? 
to at least slow that that bleeding you know and mm -hmm. then we cover how do you put a tourniquet on if you don't have a tourniquet how do you create a tourniquet how right. do you pack a wound how do you put on a chest seal mm -hmm. you know how do you do these different things to be able to save lives and and sometimes it's how do you move the person from the hot zone mm -hmm. to get them to the point if we can't get the responders to the victim people are running out of the building right yeah. so we teach them when you're running out of the building how can you bring somebody with you because in the United States today if we can get them if they've been shot collarbones down mm -hmm. and we can get them on an operating table within the golden hour and their heart is still beating when they hit the table 90 to 95 percent chance they're gonna make it and wow. oftentimes people have been shot multiple times you know mm -hmm. four six eight twelve even over 20 times people have been shot and have been able to survive because we got them to the point where the right kind of uh, medical could be you know could be provided unbelievable you know and this is this is one of the things that people learn from the movies is they think you know one shot's gonna do it which is why um, one of the things I like to tell my, my, my clients and my students is that the reason, and I, I live in occupied territory, I live in Massachusetts, the reason that you want to high cap magazine is because um, bad guys have friends. Right. And even if you have a bad guy that doesn't have friends, there's a real good chance that he's possibly on some sort of a drug right. and he's not going to know that he's been shot. Yep. So you have to shoot, you know, we, we teach people that they should shoot until they're, they're no longer a threat, until the threat's done. You don't fire one shot and sit and wait. And then when you hear police stories about, you know, why did the cops shoot him 14 times? The cops shot him 14 times because he didn't stop. Right, he was still a threat. Right. And there's, there's a delayed component from the time there's the stimulus, whatever that is, right? Mm -hmm. the, the bad actor still has a gun in their hand, they're doing a threatening gesture, whatever it might happen to be. Well, it takes a while for that impulse to process through your brain, right? And for you to frankly get tight on target, pull the trigger. Yeah. But what's interesting is there's lag time in you pulling that trigger until the stimulus says you don't need to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where you get some of those stories of why did they, you know, why yeah. did they do that so many times? Totally. We have totally. one guy on our team that says that, uh, you know, if you're called to the witness stand, you know, and they say, Charlie, why did you shoot that man 37 times? The right answer is, at 36, he was still a threat, and 38 <laughs> seemed like overkill. Does that make sense? <laughs> right. Wasn't, oh God, there's a, I wish I, I saved this video, and I think he's still, uh, he's still, still, uh, still works but there's a, a, a sheriff in Florida that was asked one time he's like um, uh, how come how come your men shot this bad guy you know 67 times he's like that's all the ammunition they had <laughs> and he's he's still out there he's still out there kicking ass we don't necessarily teach that particular aspect <laughs> but but the bottom line is you do what you need to do to stop the threat yeah. so that they don't hurt anyone else exactly. and as soon as they're no longer a threat then obviously that's when you you know that's, that's when you got to stop gotcha all right, listen. Um, we are gonna uh, we're gonna pull over and end the show here. Um, how can people find how can people find Survival Mindset? Super appreciate you asking. So uh, it's Survival Mindset or survivalmindset.us. Okay. Um, we also have if we have public programs. Most of our programs are private, but if we have a public program, you mm -hmm. know, we oftentimes have those coming up. Survivalmindset.org will list the public programs. You know, and if folks want to get you know, Lou Lust, Stephen Williford, etc., to come in and speak at their church, mm -hmm. right? Or to work with us to do a full-blown program. Yeah. They can just give us a call, 814-317-6571. Again, 814-317-6571. Mm -hmm. Or just shoot us an email. In fact, they can shoot it directly to me. It's Rick at survivalmindset.us. Okay, cool. Um, and there's lots of information on the website. They can download some information as well. Awesome, we'll put some links in, the, in your information, your contact, all your social media and stuff. And we have, we'll a big, we have a big team of people, you know, some have military background, some are guys like Steven who, you know, he just responded to a stuff. situation. Yeah. Some are law enforcement, some are EMS, some are, uh, we have one guy that's the bodyguard to the rich and famous that's on the on the team that teaches that some like tactical stuff. So. Bodyguard to the rich and famous. That could be your next project. <laughs> right. <laughs> but we appreciate you giving us the opportunity for your ride along today. This was awesome. Rick, I thank you. 
Lou, I th Lieutenant Lou, I thank you very much. I have, uh, I want to give you guys a couple of riding shotgun awesome. and some gun gram stickers. So if you would like to uh, support the show, you can buy these at the riding shotgun with charlie.com store. I have some, uh, thank you. I got some gun gram stickers and some gun, uh, right, uh, gun gram and riding shotgun stickers. This and patches. one's my favorite. I know, isn't he, this one's my isn't favorite. he badass? I put it on my car. Um, the one thing I like is, I like to tell people is, it's better to be tried by 12 than carried by six. Amen. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, well listen, let me finish up here. So listen, thank you guys for watching this episode of Riding Shotgun with Charlie. We appreciate your time. We love that you guys are here. We love that you're watching the show. If you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please make sure you do so because that's good for all the, all the YouTube stuff, which, you know, it's all YouTube stuff and it's the game we gotta play. So uh, if you don't, uh, if you haven't subscribed to the show, please make sure you do. Please make sure you support the Second Amendment Foundation. It is saf.org. Uh, check out the citizen, the oh my gosh, the Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms, the CCRBKA. Um, you should, you can check out other shows very much like Riding Shotgun with Charlie on the Self Defense Radio Network. That is SDRN.us. And um, again, thanks for watching the show. I appreciate you guys being on. Hopefully, we'll see you guys next year at the at the Rod of Iron, and we'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Thank you.